Welcome to the session inside the Vertipack engine. I'm Marco Russo from SQL BI and this session is about the internal engine used by Analysis Services and Power BI when you import data from external data sources in your data model. This engine keeps data compressed in memory and is used every time you run a query over your model. So Vertipack is the internal storage engine of these products, Power BI Desktop and Analysis Services. And this is the place that actually stores the data. And this is similar to a SQL Server database, if you want. But there are important differences because the data, are always, the data is always stored in memory and the data is stored by column. This is a huge difference compared to relational databases that we are used to use, as we will see in a moment. For this reason, the behavior of this storage engine of Vertipack is counterintuitive. Oh, by the way, Vertipack is the name of the storage engine in uh, Power BI Desktop and Analysis Services that is actually the original code name of this uh, part of the product. Uh, Microsoft tried to use uh, different names over time, marketing names like in-memory database or something like that, but actually, or X-Velocity, I remember uh, several years ago, but actually, this is the name we find in the documentation in internal events of the profiler. And for this reason, we prefer to use the name Vertipack to clarify what we're talking about. This is the internal storage engine of these uh, uh, products, Power BI and Analysis Services. Why it is important to understand how Vertipack works? There are two reasons. First, if we understand how Vertipack works, we can better choose the columns and the tables to input in our data model in order to optimize the memory and to reduce the amount of memory required for the data model. Second, if we understand how Vertipack stores the data in memory, we can better understand the counters for the performance provided by tools like DAX Studio or SQL, Profi SQL Server Profiler when you run a DAX or an MDX query over a tabular model, which could be a model in Power BI or analysis services. So let's start taking a look at how this uh, architecture works. As you see here, we have a structure where when we have a query, it could be a DAX query or an MDX query, let me get the pen, we have this query that is sent to a product. Where you see tabular model, tabular model is a what we describe as the definition of the model in Power BI or analysis services. Actually, the engine is the same, and we call this the tabular engine and the tabular model. This is the set of tables, relationships, columns, measures you have in your model. So let's say that this could be your Power BI or PBX file, hosted in Power BI Desktop. Now, when you run a report, a query is generated. In DAX, if you run the report in Power BI, and in MDX, if you create a pivot table in Excel, regardless of the language, this query is uh, executed by a first stage of the engine that is called the DAX calculation engine, or better, the formula engine. We are not going to cover this engine in this session. This session is about the storage engine. So the storage engine depends on how you import the data in your model or how you define your model. If you create a model in Power BI, connected the tables with direct query to SQL Server, it means that you key the data in SQL Server. And at that point, SQL will be your storage engine. You don't have a copy of the data in memory in your Power BI file or in your analysis services data model. And every time you run a query in DAX or MDX, one or more SQL queries are sent to the relational engine. We are not going to cover that, but just try to explain what is the role of the storage engine. When you import the data in memory, the storage engine is Vertipack. Now, Vertipack has its own language to query the model, and actually Vertipack doesn't know anything about DAX or MDX. It's just a storage engine like SQL, but this engine stores the data in memory. This is the same engine that is used when you create aggregations and you store the aggregation in memory in a composite model, where you have uh, tables connected in direct query, but you decide to create uh, aggregations in your Power BI model. And in both cases, we have uh, this data stored in Vertipack. 
For this reason, you can see sometimes cache data because actually this is a copy of the data that you have in your external data source that is used as a sort of cache in order to avoid going to the original data source when you are in direct query mode. So, based on this structure, if we move forward, we can think about the differences between the storage of the data in a regular relational database that stores data row by row and how the data is stored in Vertipack, which stores the data column by column. So the first big difference is that the organization of the data is different. For example, imagine we have a table, customers. We have a list of customers and we see that for every customer we have a row. Now, if you think about a relational database like SQL Server, but many databases are the same from this point of view, we have these rows that are stored in a storage, which could be, now we have a, a solid state disk, but once upon a time we had physical hard drive, mechanical hard drive that stored the data. And for technical reasons, the data in this storage is organized in pages, which means that when the engine has to retrieve the data, it doesn't require one or two bytes. It requires a page of data. Now, a page of data has a fixed size that, for example, in SQL Server is eight kilobytes, but this could be different. For example, Oracle could have a different page, but the idea is that this page is a fixed size. And these databases try to store as many rows as possible into the same page, because whenever you retrieve data, you have to retrieve a page. The, the database engine has to retrieve a page. So, in order to reduce the number of I.O. operation, the number of read requests, these engines try to squeeze as many rows as possible into the same page, sometimes using compression, sometimes using other techniques, or basically just reducing the size of the columns of the, of the, of the table. But the important thing that is that a row is always stored in a contiguous area of memory or of storage together with other rows until we have space available in the page. So we could have the first three rows in a page, then other three rows in another page and so on. When we have to retrieve just one column from this table, for example, imagine you want to sum the column with the balance due, you have to read a column, but in order to read the column, you have to retrieve the content of all the other columns of the same table. And if we want to read this value for all the rows, we have to read the entire amount of the table. We have to extract the entire table from the storage in order to read this column. This could be expensive and this could be the reason why in order to optimize the performance, these databases create indexes. And what is an index? Is a copy of the data in a different structure, in a different table that usually has a smaller amount of uh, columns and maybe a particular sort order. But by reducing the number of columns, you increase the number of rows that you can store into the same page, you increase the density of the data into the storage, and you improve the performance because you reduce the number of I.O. of read operations in order to retrieve the data required for a query. This structure is optimal when you have to modify data in existing rows, for example, because the impact is minimal. You just have to modify a single the page that contains the row that you want to modify. But what happens if we have um, another kind of layout, right? So this is the row storage layout, what we are used to see all the times, nothing new. Now, what happens when you have a column storage layout? Now, at this point, we have a different situation. The table is the same, so the information we want to represent is the same, but the physical organization of the data into the storage is by column. Imagine for a moment you have different files, one file for each column. So, there is one file for the column ID, which includes here, in the first position, the value of the ID for the first row, then for the second row, and so on. Same for the name, same for the balance due. 
why we should, I mean, this organization of the data makes it harder to insert one row because you have to move all the other rows that are uh, after that. So if you want to insert a row in a specific position, it could be expensive. Whereas adding a row here means adding a row in many different files, but each of these files is relatively small. Why should we do that? I mean, organizing the data this way seems more expensive, more complex. However, this could be easy, this could make it easier to just um, aggregate data for just a few columns. When you create a report, usually you don't have to include all the columns. You might want to include only, for example, the state, and you want to group the by state and you want to sum the balance to you. And if you do that, you don't need to read the other columns of the model. So you could save time by only requiring from the storage only the columns that you want. So this technique of organizing data is nothing new. Uh, columnar, columnar based databases existed in the market since a long time. But what makes VertiPack unique is the way this organization is kept in memory and of course the performance we have. So in order to understand this, I want to show you, I want to discuss with you what happens when we query a columnar database. As I said, if we want to retrieve one row, we want to retrieve all the columns for the customer N, we retrieve N, but we have to retrieve this entire content, which means that we have to open different files, we have to uh, execute different read instructions in different parts of the model, of, sorry, of the database, and this could be expensive. So retrieving the data for a single row could be expensive. But what if I want to filter, for example, one state, and I want to aggregate the data for just one state? Well, if I want to filter one state, for example, I want to filter New York and Y, I can scan only one column state and I can mark those rows that satisfy the condition that I want. Imagine if we have markers that identify the position of the rows that include the data that I want to filter. Now if I want to sum the balance due for New York, what I have to do, I have to keep these markers and I have to move these markers for the column balance due. Now, technically, these markers are bitmap indexes that are managed in a very, very uh, efficient way by the CPUs. We as humans find it difficult, for, but for a CPU, it is a very easy thing to do. And once we have these markers, what we can do, we can, oh, sorry, we can just scan this single column. And whenever we find this marker, we say, okay, we have to sum this value, sum this value, sum this value, sum this value. So we know that we have to actually sum only a few values of the table. And then we have a grand total here, which is the number we want to obtain. Now, this technique reduces the number of operations that are required when you have to filter or group data. Because usually when you do that, you don't use all the columns of the model, you only, you only use a few columns and the data in these columns is, are, is stored in a contiguous area of the storage, which in our case is a contiguous area of the memory. So pros and cons. What are the differences between a, a column-based storage and a row stage uh, storage? So in a classical row storage layout, we have a quick access to a single row and we have to do more I.O. but we don't need quick CPU. We don't have to spend CPU time. Whereas with a column storage, usually we have um, a potentially larger number of I.O. operation if we had to read the data from an external storage, but we also have to increase the CPU cost for certain operation. And this is particularly true because, uh, because uh, VertiPack 
stores the data in memory. So when I said, imagine we have one file for each column, what we really have in Vertibar is an array of data of contiguous array of memory with all the values for each column. So one column has an array, another column has another array, and so on. And the data in this column, in these columns, is stored with compression. In order to reduce the amount of memory required, there are, al there are compression algorithms that are used by Vertipak. And this compression also has another side effect. It improves the speed of the queries. Querying the model with compressed data is actually faster than what we would get if we query the same model with uncompressed data. So the compression is very important and is the topic of the next slides. So when we have data in memory, we have that this data, this data is compressed. And the compression uses two techniques uh, at the same time. The first technique is the encoding. What does it mean? If you look at the data here, we have a column with uh, a few numbers. And if you look at these numbers, these numbers are integer numbers. And even though the original data type of this column was an integer with 64 bits, a long integer, what we really need to represent the range of data that we see here is uh, 8 bits. With 8 bits, we can represent any number between 0 and 255. And if you look at the, data, at the numbers here, these numbers are within this range. So we don't need 4 bytes for each row, we need only one byte for each row. However, if we spend time looking at the data, we can see that actually the minimum value is not zero, is 194. And the maximum value is uh, probably smaller than 255. So if we subtract from the original value, the value of the minimum value we have in the column, we can represent the number in each row with, the di with this difference. And now if you look at the difference, you see that the numbers are in a different range, which is a range between 0 and 22. And there are only five, five bits required to store a number between 0 and 22. So only five bits are required for each row in this column. Which means that when you have uh, 4 bytes, uh, 4 bytes are 32 bits. In 32 bits, we can store several rows, right? Because we have 5, we have at least 6 rows in 32 bits, instead of just 1, which was the original number we had. So this compression, this is one of the techniques of compression that we have in Vertipack is called value encoding. And in this example, the value encoding is saving 37.5% of the space. Just because we, reduces the, we, reduce, we are reducing the, the, um, the size of bits required because we store the offset of the value compared to the minimum value rather than storing the original number. Of course, this works for integer numbers, but there are optimizations so that this uh, same technique can be used also for decimal numbers by applying multiplication, multiply by 10, divide by 10, or something like that. So when there is a pattern in the numbers, usually this compression can be considered. Now, the value encoding is one way to store the data in memory. There is another way that is called hash encoding. And every column can be stored either in hash encoding or value encoding. Now, if you have a string, the string cannot be stored in value encoding. It will be always stored in hash encoding. And what happens when we have hash encoding? Look at this column. This column has strings q1, q2, q3. And for some reason, this column is sorted. It's sorted by alphabetical order. So you see that there are many rows that have the same value, but this is something that we will consider later. Now, every string here is actually repeated several times. 
So if we create a dictionary, a list of unique values we have in the column, so this is what we call dictionary. In this dictionary, we have just a list of the unique values and we assign a number starting from zero, an integer number that is the position of this uh, unique string in the dictionary. The hash encoding transforms the original value into an integer value, which is the position of this uh, unique value in the hash table, also called dictionary. We usually use dictionary because uh, we have strings, but the reality is that this hash encoding can be also used for numbers. If you have several different numbers with a very, very wide distribution, and imagine, for example, you have only four unique floating point numbers, one, five, 7.5, and 11. The easiest way to store this, uh, these four values in the smallest area of memory is to create a dictionary with the four unique values you have in the column and create a dictionary, just like the string that we see here. Now, once we have the dictionary, however, we still have to represent the original value we had in the column. So our quarter is transformed into a column that has only integer numbers. And this integer number is the position of the original value in the dictionary, zero or one or two and so on. So this stores the same information in a smaller area of memory. And because the integer numbers are stored by bits, not by using a single word, it means that in this case, we only need two bits to represent numbers between zero and three, which means that in one byte, we can store four rows. So we have a huge compression just because we use the hash encoding. And of course, the hash encoding makes sense when we have a, a small number of unique values in the column. Now, every column can have either value encoding or hash encoding. But every column that has an encoding type can have also an additional compression. The encoding says how the value is represented for each value, for each position in the column. But the run encoding can actually reduce the size required to store the data of the column. Let's see an example. If we have the same value in contiguous rows, like in this case, we always have Q1, while repeating the same value multiple times, the run length encoding can actually store just the, the position and the number of rows that repeats the same value. So for example, we have 310 rows with Q1, then 219 rows with Q2, and so on. Of course, the sort order of the data in the table and in the column can produce a better or worse compression using the run length encoding. But the run length encoding can reduce, again, the size of the data in memory. Now, the ideal storage for run length encoding is uh, we store the entire table by the column quarter. If we do that, we will have only four rows here in this table of the run length encoding. But if you think for a moment, if we sort the entire table by quarter, we cannot also obtain the optimal sort order in another column. But what if we sort by quarter and product ID? Now the product ID will have one, two, and then starting from quarter two, one, two, and so on. So even though we still have, you know, the value one repeated after some rows, the result of the run length encoding compressed table is smaller compared to the original size of the column repeating the values for all the rows. And this can continue until uh, it is no longer um, a good option. It is no longer an advantage. For example, if we have a column like price, which has more or less a different value for every row, 
At this point, random encoding will increase the size of the table, not decrease. At, at that point, the VertiPack engine automatically chooses to not use the run length encoding for the column price because it doesn't warrant the effort. And so the column could be stored as is or the column could have a run length encoding if the run length encoding is an advantage. So the run length encoding is only used when we have an advantage to, for, for using this technique. Otherwise, the value uh, encoding is used. So let's see how these uh, techniques are applied together. Because every column can have both compression, one caused by the encoding and one caused by, by the run length encoding. So what happens for our quarter column? We have the hash encoding transforming the column into a dictionary and then into a reference to the dictionary. And then we have the run length encoding that reduces the side of the column by removing the duplicated values. Now, the VertiPack storage is this uh, set of data that uh, includes the result of the value or hash encoding and the result of the compression by, made by the run length encoding if this can be applied with an advantage. So we have seen that we have two kinds of compressions and this compression can be applied automatically by, Verti by the VertiPack engine but the thing is that in order to obtain an advantage in the compression, the sort order of the data matters. And what VertiPack does when you input the data, it tries to sort the data automatically, finding the best sort order for the compression. Usually you don't have to worry about this. It's the VertiPack engine that automatically sort the data for you during the uh, processing stage. When you refresh the data, this is what happens. However, this happens when the data is written in memory and the decision about the compression is made in advance, is made in an initial stage of reading the data. The entire table could be not read at once. If it is very large, based on the content of the first few rows, maybe a few thousand rows of the table, the engine makes a decision, a decision about the compression. And sometimes this could be a wrong decision. So what could happen is that there could be the need during the processing, the need for changing the encoding. We have seen that when I have a kind of encoding, I can store data in a smaller number of bits. But what happens if after thousands and thousands of rows, I get a value that cannot be represented into the encoding type that has been chosen in the beginning? When this happens, we have a re-encoding. So this means that there are cases where, especially processing large tables, the engine has to spend more time repeating the compression of data that was already processed. Now, for this reason, there are optimization possible in analysis services by setting an encoding hint for each column. Basically, you could suggest, well, it's better to use the hash encoding or the value encoding for this column. So the engine tries to use that kind of encoding instead of using the default one that could be wrong if the guess based on the first thousands of rows is wrong. This is an extreme optimization, but in Power BI Desktop, you don't have access to this kind of optimization. And this optimization is useful for very large tables, usually managed in a Power BI uh, Premium or in analysis services. So the compression is a key feature of uh, VertiPack. And this compression is, uh, of course, it depends, right? The, comp the, the ratio of the compression depends on the data you have, but on average, we could say one to eight, one to 10 is the compression ratio that you, we can find acceptable even though there could be models where the compression is much worse and models where it is much better. And basically this depends on the distribution of the data and the data types that you have. Data types means the number of unique values you have in each column. The smaller number of unique values you have in a column, the better the compression. If you have a column that has one unique value for each row, that column has the worst possible compression because basically there is no dictionary, there is no hash table, there is a value encoding, but the 
the, the value is uh, the entire range until the last number, so there are no particular optimization that can be made. Now, why the compression is important is not only to save memory. Every time you create the model, because Vertibac doesn't have additional structures or indexes, what happens is that the columns that are involved in a query are scanned for the entire table, which means that when you reference a column for any reason in a query, that column has to be read entirely for the table by the Vertibac engine. Now, if the column is stored in a small amount of RAM, because it is very highly compressed, the time required to retrieve the data from the RAM for this column is small. But if the column has no compression at all, reading that column will be particularly expensive compared to other columns. Because the RAM is usually much slower than the CPU, and the CPU could process more data if it doesn't have to access too much RAM. And this is a a big and important part of the equation, which is explained in this slide. Here you see that the time required to access to a CPU register is just one nanosecond, whereas accessing the RAM of your computer requires 100 nanoseconds, 100 times. This means that reading one byte from the RAM is, uh, requires uh, time uh, to process a 100 operation if the CPU could access local data of the CPU. And for this, this reason, the L level 1 and level 2 caches of the CPU are very important because they have a faster access time. And because the algorithm of Vertipak really leverage on the hardware and on these speeds, it's important to reduce the minimum. The, 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 the amount of RAM that has to be scanned during the, the processing of a query. So during the query, this is important. Now, another element is segmentation. The data is not processed all at once. It's not processed reading the entire amount of, you know, all the rows of a table in memory at once. What happens is that the table is divided into segments, which means that, for example, in Power BI, Power BI reads 1 million rows in memory, uncompressed, and then it starts compressing the data. And the compression requires sorting the data in different ways and so on. Now, you can understand that if you have a large table with many columns, 1 million rows could take a lot of memory already. And for this reason, the amount of rows where the local sort happens is just 1 million rows in Power BI, whereas it is 8 million rows in Analysis Services. Analysis Services is supposed to, la to run on larger servers that have more RAM, and for this reason the default is bigger, uh, because if we can read more rows at the same time, we could, not, we could obtain a better compression. So by default, Analysis Services, that has a parameter of 8 million rows that you can change if you want, can obtain a better compression compared to Power BI that only reads 1 million rows at a time. The difference is not so big, but when you have billions of rows, then these differences could be important also for other reasons that are related to the way the segments are read during the query. So the dictionary is a global object. So even though the data of the table is read in memory segment by segment and stored in memory segment by segment, the dictionary is always global, which means that even though you refresh only one partition of a table, you have always an, a dictionary that is valid for all the segments and all the partitions. Whereas the bit size, and so the size of the number of bits required for each column is a decision made at the segment level, so the re-encoding required there could be at the segment level, not at the table level. Uh, there are data management views to look at the details of this information. So, we can spend now some time looking at uh, how the data is processed. What happens when you read the data from your um, data source? What happens is that the engine starts reading the first segment. The segment is read, in, is read in memory, and at that point, the compression starts. While the compression is happening here, another segment is read in memory is read in memory. 
And when the second segment is available in memory, the compression starts. When all the segments have been loaded in memory, then a few additional structures are evaluated, like the relationships, the hierarchies, the calculated columns. A calculated column is only computed when the entire table has been compressed in memory. So this is just to explain how this works uh, over time. However, if we have a small table that only has uh, two segments, which in case of Power BI means up to two million rows, if a table has less than two segments, then the two segments are, are, are um, loaded in memory together and they are split when the third segment has data available. So what happens is that at the beginning for small tables, the amount of memory required is actually the memory required for two segments of a table. Uh, if you have a table with a lot of columns and you have an out of memory error when you try to process the data, it could be that you don't have enough RAM in Power BI for 2 million rows or for 16 million rows in analysis services, unless you change the parameter. So this happens only when you have uh, uh, two segments, uh, sorry, less than two segments, because if you have less than two segments, the entire table is stored in a single segment. So the segment could be up to two times the size of the default segment for small tables. However, if you create partitions, which means if you create partitions explicitly in your analysis services model, or you use uh, the incremental refresh in Power BI, incremental refresh creates partition and this does not apply to partition tables. If you have partitions, a segment is always of the side of the segment that you chose in your uh, system. So the first segment can be twice the size of the default segment, which means up to 16 million rows in analysis services, up to 2 million rows in Power BI. And this, this is the requirement of RAM during the processing, during the compression. However, the compression doesn't compress the calculated columns and the calculated tables because these objects are computed after the entire table has been read in memory and compressed. So what happens when the calculated columns and calculated tables are computed at the end of the refresh statement? So calculated columns are evaluated sequentially one by one after the table has been refreshed in memory. Which means that the sort order decided by the engine in order to optimize the compression cannot be applied to the calculated columns. The calculated column has the sort order that has been decided based on the other columns of the table. Result, the compression of the calculated column could be not optimal. We talk about calculated columns created in DAX. If you create a column in Power Query, from the point of view of the engine, this is a column coming from the data source and it is part of the regular compression we have seen so far. So the compression of a calculated column could be non-optimal if it, if it has many, uh, usually when it has a, a small number of unique values and the, it could be compressed better if it, is, if, it, if it was imported as a part of the original table. If the table is small, don't worry. These are problems for large tables with millions of rows, usually. What about the calculated tables? This is not a problem for the calculated tables in this sense. The calculated table is processed in memory, expanded in memory, and then compressed. The calculated table gets an optimal compression. The only problem is that the entire table has to be evaluated in memory in an uncompressed way. If you create a calculated tables, a calculated table with millions and millions of rows, be prepared to suffer in memory because the entire table at refresh time has to be expanded uncompressed and then it is compressed. If this ends well, then you have a compressor table, but the refresh operation is very memory intensive because it requires to allocate uncompressed data for the entire calculated table. So huge calculated tables with millions and millions of rows 
could require more RAM than the RAM required to read the same data from the external data source, the same amount of rows from the external data source. So keep in mind this, again, calculate tables that don't have too many rows are not a problem. When you have a calculate table with 20, 30 million rows, be careful, you could have a memory issue when you refresh the model. Now, the segments that we discussed are important also at query time. What does it mean? When you run a query, the engine makes a request to the Vertipack engine to retrieve the data for the columns, for the tables required. Now, this data is stored in memory by segment. Even though we compress the data of the columns, the data is actually stored for each column segment by segment. Now, if a table is very large, the engine, the storage engine, the Vertipack engine, can split the work of scanning the data between different cores, different parallel threads. However, the minimal allocation unit for scanning the data in memory is the segment. So if a table has only one segment, only one thread can be used to scan that column. If a table has many segments, then when the engine has to scan a large table, that column, can, that column scan can be split about between two or more threads. But if you look at the numbers, for analysis services, you need 24 million rows to use three cores of your server. Of course, when you have a Power BI, you only need one million row for one core, and so if you have a table with 12 million rows, you can already use multiple cores. However, the size of one million row is relatively small, and you pay a price for coordinating the several tasks allocated between different threads, which is the reason why analysis services uses 8 million rows, because it is more efficient when you have, especially when you have large tables, to have a larger segment size also for this parallelization operation. Result of this, faster queries because the query can use multiple threads. But remember, if you have a small table, up to 1 million rows, you will never see many threads used by the storage engine. Now, if you have analysis services, you have access to this configuration that I show you better here, which is the default segment row count. This default segment row count in the analysis services properties can change the size of a segment for all the following refresh operation. This setting is a, a global setting at the server level and it is applied to all the following refreshes. So technically, if you create a backup of a model and you restore this model, the size of the segments is the size that you had on the server when you run the refresh. But this could be different from the size of the segment that you have now in your server. You cannot change this in Power BI. This is only available today in analysis services, both Azure analysis services and analysis services on-premises. So here in this slide, we see in more detail the default segment row count, which is the property for setting the segment size. And we see another property, which is the processing time box second per million row, which is the timeout to stop trying different sort orders. You can imagine that one problem of the compression is that there could be many different ways to sort the data in order to find the optimal compression. So in order to avoid spending too much time, there is a time allowed to do this operation. And if this time, if, if you have many, many columns, hundreds of columns, the time available by default could be not enough. You can increase that and you can obtain a better compression if you provide more time for the compression itself. Now, if you increase this number, you might not see any difference because uh, usually this is already a large number. You can see from some data management view when this number has been reached because there is a, a like a timeout that is a, uh, described in a few data management views that uh, can say, okay, this column didn't get all the possible combination for the compression. 
However, my suggestion, don't consider changing these settings unless you have very large tables and you can experiment that by increasing this number, you actually get a better compression. The default is something that automatically adapts to the hardware that you have. Other two structures stored in memory by Vertipak are hierarchies, user hierarchies and attribute hierarchies. The user hierarchies are those hierarchies that you create selecting two or more columns of the table, providing a predefined navigational hierarchy to the user, like year, month, and day, or category, subcategory, product. So this simplifies the navigation, usually these structures are small. But every column, every column in the table by default has an attribute hierarchy. The attribute hierarchy is a structure that contains the values sorted of the column according to the sort order of the column. So if you use sort by column, sort by column generates a, a sort order different than the sort order that you would have for the column using the natural sort order of the column. This structure has been created mainly to enable MDX queries over the tabular model. Even though today the same structure is also used by DAX as an additional index, but if the structure is not present, DAX works the same. For this reason, if you create a model for analysis services with Tabular Editor or Visual Studio, you can set the available in MDX property to false to disable creating the attribute hierarchy. Why? You save storage, you save memory, you save RAM. This structure could be expensive. The cost of these structures is similar to the dictionary. It depends on the number of unique values you have in the column. So this is just something that you may want to, remo to remove from the model to save memory, even though uh, we suggest to not remove that unless you can demonstrate that you save a lot and you don't have a side effect in query performance. So how much data do you need to process a table? It depends on many factors, but I would say that by default, we could say we need the memory to store the data at the end of the process, so we can measure the side of the table compressed in memory. But during the processing, if you process a table that you already processed before, the new table is stored in a new area of memory and only at the end there is a replacement of the old structure with the new structure. This allows to query the model while you are refreshing the model, especially on analysis services or on Power BI the service. Now, you need one copy of the data, the old data, one copy for the new data, but you also need the data to read the uncompressed data during the refresh and to apply the compression. And this could be a, a larger factor. So we usually provide a three times the memory of the processed object as a way to roughly estimate the amount of RAM you need to complete a refresh operation successful. So how can we estimate how much memory do we need for a table, for our database? Well, the memory consumption depends on different factors. The number of columns, of course, but before looking at the number of rows, we have to look at the density of the data in the columns, at the number of unique values of, uh, uh, for each column. If a column has uh, only four unique values, even though you have millions of rows, the, the, the column ha can have a very high compression. Whereas a relatively small table that has always unique values in every row for each column, is going to get no compression at all, and it, it could be more expensive. So we usually look at the cardinality of the column, which is the number of unique values we have in the column. The data type could be important because, we, because we, if we have a string, we need a dictionary for sure, and the length of the string determines the size of the dictionary. Of course, if you have a small number of unique uh, strings, we don't care too much if the, we have long strings. But if we have millions of strings, then the average size of the string matters because it increases the size of the dictionary. And of course, the number of rows matters too, but usually, especially in Power BI models, for example, the cardinality of the column is way more important uh, compared to the number of rows on the table. 
And for the string, of course, the string, the average size of the string could be important because of the size of the dictionary, as I said. We don't have an easy formula to apply here. It's some heuristic that you have to apply to, to your evaluation, but with the experience, you will be able to estimate the number in the right way. We usually use a rough, as a rough estimate, um, we divide by eight, by 10, the size of the largest tables, but sometimes this is not good if the table has a lot of unique values, but we could uh, remove those columns if you don't really need, and we will see this later. So in order to understand how we are consuming the memory, because if we want to optimize the memory for our model, we want to investigate in how the memory is used by the different columns, we have out of the box data management views which are queries that we can send to the engine, to analysis services or to Power BI, in order to retrieve information about the data distribution of uh, um, data distribution in tables, columns uh, for uh, your database. However, querying these uh, views is possible, but is already made by a tool that we have uh, uh, made available on SQL BI, which is Vertipack Analyzer. Actually, Vertipack Analyzer is a tool that is used now within um, DAX Studio. So I will show you in the next demo how we can use DAX Studio to export the data for Vertipack Analyzer, but also how we can use just DAX Studio to investigate this information uh, retrieved by the Vertipack Analyzer library that is now embedded in DAX Studio. In order to show you a Vertipack Analyzer example, I open a Power BI desktop file, which has a model with several tables. And the largest table here, the sales table, has 12 million rows. Now, let's go to DAX Studio. DAX Studio is a tool where we have available uh, Vertipack Analyzer is embedded within DAX Studio. And we can go in the Advanced tab and click on View Metrics in order to see here in this area the information provided by Vertipack Analyzer. Now I'm increasing the font so it is visible. And you see we have several tabs here, the list of the tables, the list of the columns, the relationships, the partitions, and the summary. Let's start from the summary. The summary is the total size in memory of the model, which is this number here, 303 uh, megabyte. And if I have a uh, uh, if I go to the Tables tab, you see that for each table, I can see the sides of each column. Now, for each column, we have several information like the cardinality, the table size, the column size. And the column size is what is more interesting here uh, because this is the information about what is the cost for this specific column for the entire model. And you see that these columns that have the largest cardinality, the larger number of uh, unique values are those two columns that are more expensive for the entire data model. So this is uh, something you can obtain easily, but you also have information about relationships and partitions. So if you go to the Vertipack Analyzer tab, the download of Vertipack Analyzer, you can get an additional file that provides you an Excel file that you can use to import data exported from DAX Studio in a VPAX file where you have more details about this information. You can see information about the compression, the number of bits for each segment, uh, used for each segment, the data type used, uh, the hash encoding, value encoding, and all the details that describe what we have seen so far in the slides. The next step is trying to understand what happens when we query a model. When you query a model, Vertipack just has to read the data from the memory but there could be some requirement for temporary tables in memory, which is the need for memory at query time. So is it possible we need additional memory at query time with Vertipack? And the answer is yes. Simple queries usually don't require too much memory, just the memory to produce the materialization of the result. But complex queries could require additional memory. Additional data has to be stored in temporary tables that could increase the amount of memory required to execute the query. So now we're going to see a few of the problems that we might face in uh, querying the model. And the first uh, subject here is the uh, materialization. 
So when we have a query, the result has to be materialized and sent to the formula engine. The formula engine always gets data uncompressed. So the result of a storage engine query must uncompress the data. But is this required only for the final result or is it required also for some intermediate stage of the execution of the query? So in an optimal query, we only have a materialization of the result from the storage engine that corresponds 100% to the result required by the DAX query. But sometimes this is not possible. So we will see how the materialization can happen in the storage engine in different steps. So let me go back to the slide. Now let's examine what happens if we have an early materialization. With an early materialization, the data is stored in memory in a compressed way. So you see that this area here, this area is representing the, the data in memory compressed in VertiPack. Now, if this data in memory is materialized in a regular table that only includes the columns that have been involved in a DAX query, what we see here is a DAX query. And in this DAX query, we are saying we want to group by customer ID. We want to filter a particular product and a particular store, and we want to aggregate by sales price. So this is the definition of the query. So we use only four columns here. And these are the four columns included here. Now, if the materialization happens immediately, materializing the content of these uh, four columns only for the rows that we could include for all the tables, we have this. We have a materialized table that has uh, the same data like these four duplicated in every row. And you see also three here is duplicated in every row, but this was the same representation we had here in this particular case. Now, at this point in the materialized table, the work condition, the filter for product ID equal to four and the store ID equal to one is applied. And then the projection that only selects a few columns is applied. And then at the end, we have the final output of the DAX query, which is just one row and two columns. But in order to provide this result in our visualization, in our report, a materialization much bigger than that has been required. And this requires more memory because the materialization is in uncompressed memory. So the optimal execution for the storage engine would be a late materialization, which means that the storage engine is able to generate the final output without creating additional tables in memory. How is it possible to execute the very same query using the latest possible materialization? The idea is that the work condition is applied over the compressed data so that the result is just a bitmap index, which is still an additional area, but it is just one bit for every row. And when we have multiple conditions that have to be applied in an end logic together, the result is, a, is an additional bitmap index. And the result of these logical conditions is very fast on our CPU. This result is also very small and it can be applied to the scan of the other columns involved in the evaluation without additional memory required. So this scan uses only the bitmap index, which is a very small structure, not the uncompressed materialization we described before. And the result of that is used to do the final stage of the grouping, sorry, and to obtain the final materialization. So this or this probably, this is the intermediate materialization or this could be the final materialization. Both cases, we have a much smaller materialization required and a much smaller memory requirement. So when we have an optimal execution, we have a late materialization, which means that the storage engine, VertiPack, is able to apply most of the filter and grouping conditions so that the formula engine only receives the minimal amount of data in order to generate the final result for the end user. So when this materialization happens, when in a DAX query we have complex uh, iterators, complex joins, complex conditions like, for example, uh, nested iterators or context transition, this operation could require larger materialization. 
In a worst case scenario, if you have to materialize an entire table and all the columns, the result is usually much bigger than the size of the table compressed in memory. If you have to materialize the entire table, it could be very expensive. So, usually the DAX uh, and the formula engine takes care of that, but you have to write good DAX code. And we can see in the next example what happens when we have a, a large materialization in DAX. In order to show the materialization issue, I prepared the demo with a table, numbers, with 100 million rows. This table has all the combinations between two numbers, between 1 and 10,000, stored in two different columns, num1 and num2. If I create a DAX query that just counts the number of rows returned by this uh, summarize, which gets the existing combination of num1 and num2 applying a filter, and I execute this query, enable the server timings, which will show what happens at the storage engine level when I run the query. Let's go. You will see that this query here required two seconds and a half to provide a result and generated the materialization of here, let me enlarge this, 33 megabytes. And this materialization could be much bigger if, for example, I move this number from 9,000 to 8,000, now it is double. And if I don't put a limit to the materialization, the final result could be much bigger than that. And by the way, I forgot to clear the cache now because I'm executing this query for the first time, you will see that the storage engine will uh, take uh, a lot of time to be executed and then the storage engine has to count the result produced by the storage engine. So the total amount of time for the execution is 13 milliseconds and we had a materialization of 86 megabytes. Now, if I execute the same query by using another approach, which is I want to count all the combination between uh, num1 and num2 uh, using the same uh, filter, let's put here 8000, what happens when I execute this query? You will see that the materialization is much smaller. This is not a, a fast query, actually, but at least we have a much smaller memory requirement. You see that now the memory requirement is about 80 kilobytes multiplied by 3, so 240 kilobytes. And the execution is also faster. Why it is just one second instead of uh, uh, 15 seconds like we have seen before? Because we didn't have to create a large materialization. So the materialization is something that is very important in the query execution. And so here we can see that depending on the technique we use, we could have a, a smaller or bigger price to pay for the materialization. So how you create the model, how you use the relationships, how you write the DAX code, has an, uh, has a, is very important for the materialization and for the performance of your query. So now that we have seen all these details, can we recap a few best practices to reduce the memory and improve the performance? The most important best practice is just import the columns that you need. Don't import columns you don't need, especially if the columns have a large cardinality, a large number of unique values. And this means that you will also have smaller relationships, because if you have a smaller number of unique values in a primary key, you also have a smaller number of rows in the relationship. And try to get rid of large dimensions if you can, because if you have a dimension with a 10 millions of customers, it is more expensive than a table with 1 million of customers. Now, you can say, Marco, we have 10 million of customers. Okay, if you have 10 million of customers, true, but sometimes the dimension is large because you have multiple versions of the same customer, and this could be expensive. You have to evaluate whether you can reduce the size of the table you use as a dimension in case this is proved to be a performance issue. Don't get my words as an absolute uh, reference because uh, you could have a good model even though you have 10 million of uh, customers. It depends on the hardware, it depends on many other details. You have to try, you have to measure the performance and the memory requirements of your model. So if we want to reduce the cardinality for existing columns, what can we do? Well, actually we can do something. If I have a column that has a timestamp, first of all, you have to split date and time in two columns, 
so that the date has only as many unique dates you have and the time has only the time within a day and if you round the time by minute or by hour you reduce the number of unique values you have in the column you don't need the milliseconds you probably don't need the seconds for your analysis depending on your analysis but usually these are data that you can reduce in precision so that you reduce the cardinality of the column same thing for the floating point values if you're measuring money you want all the cents but if you are measuring the temperature for example you might need only one decimal point and all the other numbers are something that you could get rid when you do the analysis if you can of course this will save you a lot of uh, memory something that you will not perceive as a requirement when you store the data in your relational database um, Creating calculated columns is expensive, so you might not want to create too many calculated columns because this could require space. And the same, avoid giant dimension if you are used to the dimensional modeling, uh, certain dimensions that have a lot of rows just to store many columns with a small cardinality. Up to a certain point, a few thousands of rows is fine, but if you end up having a table with millions and millions of rows as a giant dimension, you probably want to split that table in different dimensions, different tables. So if we spend a few seconds, think about what we store in a model. We import, at the beginning, we want, maybe we want to import all the columns, but imagine you have a table like this. We have the order ID, the product ID in your sales table. Well, you, you probably want to get these columns because you need these columns or already product ID because these columns are needed. You want these columns. Uh, you, want to, you want to know what is the product and what is the uh, customer. Well, for the order ID is a big question mark because if, if I need the order ID to connect other tables, I want to keep this identifier. If the order ID is a primary key for the table not used in any relationship and not used in any report you could remove that from this uh, uh, table then we have the quantity the price and the discount and maybe we have this sales amount which is the result of a formula applied over quantity price and discount now in terms of number of unique values usually quantity price and discount have a smaller number of unique values compared to sales amount sales amount will probably have a larger number of unique values and so the sales amount size and memory tends to be bigger than these three columns uh, together but really it depends this is true for relatively small models a few million rows when you start having billions of rows maybe you want to keep this column because at the end of the day it will be faster than these three columns, even though it requires a large amount of memory and a large dictionary, because the real problem here is that the size of the dictionary, where you have all the unique values of the column, tends to be much large. And if each value is used only in a few transactions, this cost is uh, impacting the cost of the memory for your model in a significant way. So, Conclusion, Vertipack is a very efficient engine, very fast, very quick. The compression is good. There could be a better compression, but the compression is good because it is fast when you query the model. The compression has to keep the read operation very fast. So certain techniques of optimization of compression are not used by Vertipack because they will not provide good performance at query time. A single column scan is very fast and when you have to access multiple columns this could require materialization depending on the kind of aggregation and operation you do. So you have to analyze the query plan, you have to understand the access to figure out when materialization happens if it is caused by the formula you are using by some DAX technique that could be replaced by more efficient techniques or because of the requirements require you to do that. You have to evaluate and optimize accordingly. Thanks for watching this session.